life, get something to drink so you don't have to get up and leave. I am Brittany and I'm here joined with a couple teammates from the LeapFrog team and we're going to be talking about uh, about a lot of really interesting things tonight. So if you would like, you can comment your name in the chat and where you teach and if you have any um, specific questions or things that you'd like to learn more about today, feel free to do that. And we're just gonna give everybody about a minute to get logged in. I can see we already have some people joining us. This is so exciting. Um, yeah. And if you're joining us on Facebook, if you wanna type in the chat and say hello, we'll give you a shout out. And I'm so excited to get talking about different strategies to use with different kids uh, this year with distance learning and to see what kind of insights you guys have to share with all the teachers and all the educators who are watching us today. So hi, Debbie and hi, Nancy. So glad to hear you love LeapFrog and that you teach in Chicago. So it looks like we have some LeapFrog fans here. Oh, I see Sherry, hello from Connecticut. Hello from Connecticut as well. Um, hello, Liliana, nice to meet you. All right, I think we're gonna jump in. So hello, everybody, good evening. My name is Brittany and I am here with Class Tag and I'm a part of the Class Tag team. And I'm here with a couple people from LeapFrog and I'm so excited to introduce them to you and for us to get started with our discussion tonight. So I would like to first introduce Dr. Carolyn James. And she, I'm gonna give her a minute to let, introduce a little and give her you a little bit of her background and then I'll introduce our next guest. Okay, hi, I'm Carolyn, it's great to be here. Uh, I'm a member of the learning team uh, at LeapFrog. We're based in San Francisco Bay Area. And I began my career in the elementary classroom, taught uh, mostly upper grades for 10 years before heading to grad school to Michigan State where I studied early literacy development. And uh, while I was working on my dissertation, I worked a lot on curriculum development, served as a reading specialist uh, before taking a job at Sacramento State where I taught in the College of Ed, uh, teaching uh, teachers of reading and students who were getting their teaching credentials before landing at LeapFrog, mm -hmm. where I've had really a dream job um, serving on the learning team as the literacy specialist. So my job is to ensure that all of the curricular aspects of our uh, read and write products are infused with the findings of the latest research. Thank you so much. And I'd like to next introduce uh, Tiffany Sakaguchi. She is here with us. And Tiffany, if you wouldn't mind uh, letting us know a little bit about you for our audience. Sure. Hi, I'm Tiffany Sakaguchi and I'm the math specialist on the learning team. Um, when I started my teaching career, um, I was a math teacher in Virginia, and I taught everything from sixth grade up to algebra and geometry in both public and private schools. I have my bachelor's in mathematics from James Madison University and my master's in education from Virginia Tech. Uh, prior to LeapFrog, I was a curriculum developer for Amazon Education, and now at LeapFrog, I help create playful learning experiences. All right, I love hearing about that, especially as a former kindergarten teacher. I'm really a big fan of playful learning experiences and I'm so excited to jump in. So um, my first question today would be for Carolyn. So Carolyn, my question to you is, I'm wondering how could I support my child's reading development in a playful way that is exciting at home and during COVID and all of this craziness? Yeah, well, I love that you included the word playful in your question, mm -hmm. because to be honest, there really are so many in the moment, quick and easy activities that you can do at home to support your child's reading development. And today I'd love, really love to focus on two key skills that are really linked to future reading success, supported by a long line of reading research. So mm -hmm. the first skill is alphabet knowledge. And that's really just this ability for kids to be able to name the letters and their sounds. And the second skill is phonological awareness, which refers to the ability to hear and manipulate the sounds of language. Mm -hmm. And the first set of activities I'll describe are really around variations of the old game, I Spy. So if the little ones are really just beginning to recognize the letters of the alphabet, you can start simply by just saying, I spy the letter M. 
And of course, you want to start with letters that might be familiar, like letters in your child's name or common letters like A and T. And it's important to keep in mind that while there are only 26 letters in our English alphabet, remember there are uppercase and lowercase versions. And while a few of the letters like S and V share the same shape in uppercase and lowercase, most of the letters like D and R have unique uppercase and lowercase shapes. So little ones have to be able to recognize 40 unique letter shapes in order to identify their letters. Now you can also use iSpy to support phonological awareness. So mm -hmm. uh, if your child's beginning to map um, sounds, you can say things like I spy something that begins with the sound or I spy something that rhymes with hat. Mm -hmm. And then you can move on and bump up the challenge a little bit and challenge the kids to identify things that, or you can say I spy something that ends with the sound mm, or I spy something that has the sounds t -g. and then your child can blend those sounds and identify the object in the environment. Mm -hmm. That sounds so fun. I love that. And that it's the same game that you can use for multiple skills so that there's not a whole bunch of relearning involved. And that's that's really that's a really great takeaway. And these are like really great activities for for little, little kids. But what about kids who might be a little bit ahead and, and might already know their letters and sounds? Right. So kids that are beginning to develop their phonics knowledge can benefit from a game that I'm going to refer to as the word factory. And so kids um, are, are really um, engaged in fulfilling orders from what we're calling the word factory. So they can have fun rearranging and putting together letters and sounds to create brand new words to fulfill their word factory orders. Mm -hmm. And you can start by pulling out your letter tiles or letter magnets or just little pieces of paper with letters written on them and start by just spelling a simple word like an, A-N and give your child the opportunity to um, use the letters C, F, and M to make brand new words like can, fan, and man. Once they've mastered that, swapping out new beginning word sounds, then you can have them swap out ending word sounds to make new words. So changing words like pan to pat or dog to dot. And finally, you can really up the challenge by having them swap out the middle vowel sounds and change words like thin to fan or a dog to dig. And so all the while they're built, fulfilling those word factory orders, they're using their letter sound relationship knowledge to make brand new words and be able to spell and read those new words in text. Amazing. And so thinking about practicing reading, how can, how can I or how can parents encourage kids to read more at home? Well, I love this question because we know there is so much research on the fact that the more kids read, the better readers they become. Mm -hmm. And even if little ones aren't reading independently, certainly being read to is part of that equation. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I wanna recommend is uh, making sure that people um, take advantage of the wide range of free resources available from the libraries mm -hmm. in your communities. I personally am a huge fan of the free OverDrive app that you can get from your library or your school. And with OverDrive, you can download free Kindle books. And they also have read-along books that have text that highlights as it's read out loud. You can get anything from storybooks to chapter books, um, books on a range of topics from dinosaurs mm -hmm. to space travel. Um, and they even have books that are based on a lot of kids' favorite characters like Paw mm -hmm. Patrol, and Pokemon, you name it. Oh, I love um, it. Yeah. So, and then you can also get audiobooks, um, which we know uh, does a great job of supporting kids' listening comprehension and vocabulary development. Uh, mm -hmm. I also want to um, uh, let you know that, at least in my library, and I'm sure in libraries in, in many communities, mm -hmm. children's librarians are putting together really fun grab bags that you can come mm -hmm. by and pick up. And what I love about this offering is that it allows kids to engage with books that they may not have selected on their own. And I've been learning a lot about what the scholar Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop refers to as using books as mirrors and windows. So we wanna engage kids with books that are serve as mirrors that reflect uh, experiences that are familiar to them but we also want them to engage with books that serve as windows that allow them mm -hmm. to see and learn more about the lives and experiences of others. Absolutely. And 
So thinking about that, so thinking about the lives and experiences of others, it sounds like that could be something that could be incorporated into a kid's day-to-day -day routine, like learning about stories, learning about others. Absolutely, absolutely. And a, another recommendation along that line, ex exposing kids to, to more of what's out there, mm -hmm. um, I really want to recommend the growing number of podcasts that are specifically designed for uh, kids and, and families. So um, along that line of building background knowledge, uh, the American Public Media produces a podcast known as Brains On, and mm -hmm. it's a, a science-based uh, podcast that exposes kids to a wide range of topics that can build on their background knowledge. Along with science-based podcasts, there are also story-based podcasts. So there's one known as Stories Podcast, um, and each week it, offer up, it offers up 20-minute uh, episodes that are based on classic fairy tales, but they also have some of their own original content. Mm -hmm. And there's a third podcast called Circle Round, and I really love this one because it was uh, produced by parents of young children, and they they have 10 to 20 minute episodes that are essentially radio plays that are adapted from folk tales from around the world. Mm -hmm. So there you get some of that um, some of that window experience through a podcast. And mm -hmm. each episode concludes with an activity that's designed to prompt more conversation about the story. I love that. And and podcasts are not only something that it's it's kind of like a low stakes. Um, for the kiddo who's listening to it because it's they're still practicing listening skills and that comprehension piece, but it's also something the whole family can get involved in. So do you got, do you have any other ideas to support this connection for families when they're trying to encourage reading at home? Exactly. Um, I think we've all become more uh, familiar with being on video calls. Um, mm -hmm. One silver lining maybe of the pandemic. Um, so it, I really want to encourage families to take those opportunities for loved ones to schedule story times um, mm -hmm. and read aloud to, to children that they may not be able to be with in person. Um, mm -hmm. And if you're dealing with different time zones, of course, it's, per it's perfectly possible to record those read alouds so that mm -hmm. kids can enjoy them at any time. And mm -hmm. I really want to remind people that kids love it when you ham it up. So mm -hmm. I'm not afraid to really use those character voices and really try to set the tone for the story. Mm -hmm. And one more thing, the just I'm I'm looking over our chat, um, Carolyn, and I just I was noticing some people were asking about if you could just repeat the name of the second podcast that you recommended. I had the first one and the third one, but you were on such a roll. I need to get the second one. Sure. <laughs> so the first one, I'll go through all three. The first one okay, was perfect. Brains On. The second one I think I mentioned was Stories Podcast. I think that was number two. And then the third one was Circle Round. Okay, great. Thank you. We got a lot of questions about those. Okay, great. So, and now, my, thank you so much, Carolyn. Um, so now my next question is actually going to be for Tiffany. So Tiffany, how can parents, I'm, I'm looking to you as my math expert. So how can parents incorporate more math into daily activities to support their kiddos? Yeah, there, there's many ways that we can incorporate math into mm -hmm. family activities. So for example, just everyday things that happen, such as how many plates do we need for dinner tonight? How tall are you and how much have you grown in the past year? Uh, what is the distance and time to school? Or how does that change if we take a different route or if there's unexpected traffic? And it's important uh, for children to understand that math is useful in their daily lives mm -hmm. and, to make, and to just make it fun and embed it into things that you do every day. This way, when it does come up for school or in life, that it's not so stressful. Um, and, and incorporating math into everyday activities, it helps improve children's attitudes about math. So let me give you a few examples of ways that we can include math in daily lives. So when you're shopping at the grocery store, one way you can practice math is by playing a game where you try to guess the total grocery bill before you check out. So as you're putting items into the cart, you can round each price to the nearest dollar and then calculate the total. Mm -hmm. If you're buying multiples of a particular item, you can also practice multiplication. So if you're mm -hmm. buying three items and they cost a dollar each, that would be $3. Mm -hmm. And also take a look at the unit price on the price tags. Point that out and show them, this tells you how much it costs maybe per ounce if you're buying the Cheerios. Mm -hmm. So how much does it cost per ounce for the small box versus the big box? And which one's the better deal? Also, when you're out at a restaurant or shopping, you can talk about how much change you'll get from the cashier. 
So if you give them a $20 bill, how much would you get back if the cost of your food was $14.25? Mm -hmm. Also, try calculating the tip and talk, talk out loud as you make, make your calculation. So talking mm -hmm. out loud helps the kids learn how to do it on their own. And also, when you're filling up the car with gas, you can estimate the price of filling it up. So based on the fuel gauge, how much fuel is in the tank before you fill it up? Mm -hmm. Also, how many gallons does your car even hold? So this is a great opportunity for you to do a little research either on your phone or in the manual. Um, you know, it shows them we don't always have answers to everything right away. Mm -hmm. and so also, given the current price of gas, how much do you expect the total to be? And you can make an estimate and see how close you can get. Make it a game. Who can get the closest? I, I love all of those suggestions because they're just such great real-time applications. It's not anything extra you need. It's something you can do while you're already getting something done. It's built into those daily tasks. And for a lot of families right now during COVID, they're not really leaving the house that much. So a lot of those suggestions were awesome and that they were about a lot of situations outside of the home. But what recommendations do you have for families that are at home and might want to come up with some of these games? Yeah, absolutely. The kitchen is a fantastic place for math. So <laughs> for younger kids, you know, even the ones who are really little, you can help point out shapes while you're eating. So for example, mm -hmm. a cookie is a circle or the brownie is a square. Mm -hmm. uh, you can even show them how to change one shape into another by cutting the square brownie into two triangles. Mm -hmm. You can also talk about three dimensional shapes. So oranges and blueberries are spheres and a box of cereal as a rectangular prism. Mm -hmm. And for older kids, go ahead and let them help out. Let them join in in the kitchen. So cooking a recipe is a great way to work with numbers and fractions. So mm -hmm. try doubling a recipe or having it. Mm -hmm. And have your child measure and convert fractions when cooking. You can also maybe even talk about the number of teaspoons in a tablespoon, fluid ounces in a cup, cups in a gallon, and so forth. Also, you can do simple math when you're maybe even cooking a ham. So if mm -hmm. the ham needs to cook for 15 minutes per pound and the ham weighs seven pounds, then do a little multiplication. So seven times 15 is 105 minutes or one hour, 45 minutes for that ham to cook. That That's beautiful. I mean, that way better math than I can do. And I know as a student, I struggled with math and that probably would have made me buy it a little bit more. So thank you for that. And so thinking about that, and so like my my personal like selfish sharing experience, thinking about kids who struggle with math and don't like making mistakes or kids who really struggle with that mental component, how can parents build their child's confidence or make math seem a little bit more fun? Yeah, remember math is a process and making mistakes mm -hmm. is all part of doing math. And mm -hmm. it's how we learn and it's how we learn, you know, learn how to become better problem problem solvers. Mm -hmm. So as a parent, you can help teach your child that it's perfectly okay to make mistakes mm -hmm. and math can take time and effort. And it's also, you know, you want to encourage them to keep going to try again. So when your child is solving a problem, pause and give your kid a little bit of time to figure things out on their own before stepping in to help. And mm -hmm. as a parent, when you find yourself doing math, think about what you're doing out loud and say what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. This helps, you know, your child understand the math that you're using math. And even if they don't quite understand the math just yet, they're still learning as you're speaking about it. Mm -hmm. And also when they do get an answer correct, you wanna celebrate their hard work and their effort and encourage them to, that they were doing great. Mm -hmm. I, and, and I love hearing you emphasizing modeling the metacognition for fam, for parents. So thinking like from a teacher lens, I'm saying, oh, wow, it's so great to encourage parents to think out loud because thinking out loud is su it's such a great way to teach other kids how to think when they don't, they don't necessarily know what is that next step. So thinking about think time, what about families who have more than one kid at home. So they are looking for a couple different activities they can do, but they've got a big age gap between their, their kids. Yeah, absolutely. You know, especially right now with so many, you know, kids and families at home and we're doing a mix of homeschooling, Zoom school, hybrid school. Um, you know, we have kids of different ages at home. So mm -hmm. there's, you know, many activities that we can do that's accessible to the youngest learners at home, mm -hmm. even and while providing extension for the older kids. Mm -hmm. And even if you only have one kid at home, there's many activities that can grow with your child as their math skills develop. Mm -hmm. So one easy um, activity is a, count, a counting game uh, with addition. 
So you can just simply look around your house and find things that are easily countable. So maybe stacking cubes, building blocks, bear counters, cut up squares of paper, it doesn't really matter. So for a younger child, have them create small groups of items. So maybe from one to 10, if they're just starting their counting. And help your child out and have them touch each of the items as they're counting. That way, you know, they make sure not to skip and don't count any items twice. Mm -hmm. When they've successfully counted the set of items, ask them how many there are. So this helps and reinforce the idea of cardinality. Mm -hmm. And this is the understanding that the last number used to count the group of objects represents how many are in the group. Mm -hmm. And, you know, have this younger child do this for multiple sets for whatever numbers they're practicing. And to make the task a little bit harder, you can actually have your kid create the group. So have them create the group with nine building blocks. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, because it, 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 when they produce it themselves, it makes it a little bit more difficult than just counting a group that's already been made. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then for an even older child, after a few of the sets have been created, you can ask the older child to select two of the sets and add them together to find the total so they can do it mm -hmm. together. I love that build up. So that is so great. So thinking about games, are, is there any other game that you can recommend to help practice math? Yeah, definitely. A good game that comes to mind is the classic game, the card game of war. This was a fun game mm -hmm. that I enjoyed playing when I was younger. Um, and it can be played with kids of all ages and the parents can join in too. And by changing the rules of the game, we can increase the difficulty level. Mm -hmm. So for the basic game, you know, you want to deal out the entire deck to all the players and then the players overturn one card and the player with the highest number wins and takes all the cards for that round. Mm -hmm. And the player with the most cards at the end of the game wins. So mm -hmm. when you want to focus this game on math, you'll probably want to pull out all the cards from two to ten and then set mm -hmm. the remaining cards to the side. Mm -hmm. uh, for a simple alternative to this to this game, the player with the lower number can win. And if you want to practice addition and multiplication, you can have each player turn over two cards and then add or multiply those two numbers. And the player with the highest sum or product wins that round. And for even more of a challenge, you can practice negative numbers. So mm -hmm. let the red numbers represent the negatives and the black the positive. Mm -hmm. And when practicing negative numbers, you can play either the one or two card version of the game, mm -hmm. depending on the ability of your child. And so this game has lots of great versatility and it's just one game and like you really just switch it up. And so, you know, by doing these activities at home, you know, feel free to get the older kids involved, have them help teach the little ones as well. Mm -hmm. Have them set up an activity for you, set it up for the younger child. You know, kids love playing in school and we all learn more when we teach. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and especially when kids get to collaborate with each other and teach each other, they get to buy into that even more, right? Um, so great, thank you for that. So actually, we're gonna get ready to jump into our question and answer. I know that we've got a bunch of questions coming in, so I'm actually gonna show our first question on the screen. So this is a reading question. So I'm going to be directing this uh, question towards Carolyn. So Carolyn, Danielle asks, do you have any advice on how to encourage struggling first grade readers? Uh, yes, so I think one of the most important things to keep in mind is just really trying to build uh, the little one's confidence mm -hmm. and really starting with just those basics. So really starting with a, a good assessment so that mm -hmm. you know exactly where their gaps are um, mm -hmm. and starting with those uh, consonants that make predictable sounds and the short vowel sounds and putting those together and taking those apart in multiple ways. Using that word factory game is a good uh, strategy. Mm -hmm. I'm using letter tiles and magnets and just giving them plenty of opportunities to blend those letters and sounds together and see how they operate. Um, mm -hmm. And allowing them opportunities to read along with you. Sometimes mm -hmm. reading along with an older buddy or a more advanced reader can provide them the confidence they need to practice their oral reading fluency, which we know is really important for um, mm -hmm. building their reading skills. Um, and I think just matching them up with books that they're really interested in. Mm -hmm. um, so you can even use um, uh, engines like Goodreads. I use it as an adult, but they mm -hmm. have a they have a nice children's section too, mm -hmm. where you can really try to match uh, text with your child's reading level because mm -hmm. you certainly don't want to put your child uh, match a child up with a text that's too hard for them. So making sure that they have a text that's at their level and mm -hmm. that includes the words that have the spelling patterns that they've really mastered so that they can build those 
build that level of confidence. Absolutely. I'm a whole, I'm a big proponent of letting them show off a little bit, let it be easy a little bit so we could build that confidence. Thank you. Um, our next question we had was, I'm not sure if it is from Angel or Angel, um, but um, they're wondering what is the best recommendation for children who get frustrated easily during learning activity? So I'm going to let either one of you jump in on this. Um, and see what what what's your advice? What is your what's your take on this? Yeah, you know, if if a kid's getting frustrated, you know, with an activity, you know, it's good to maybe you know step back and pause a little bit, you know, take a break. Um, mm -hmm. In particular for math, if if a kid is struggling with a particular math activity, or if if they just have like an attitude of you know I'm not good at math, I can't do this, mm -hmm. then you know, refining you know, strengths that they do have. So maybe they are really good at measuring or geometry and pointing out like, you know, you, you know, you can do this and, you know, you might be a little frustrated with something you can't do, but, you know, reinforcing that it does take time and practice. Um, and, you know, maybe trying something, you know, a little bit easier and then building your way up into something that's a little bit more difficult. Mm -hmm. I love that, Re building it up. That's great. Thank you. All right. So next question that we have from the chat that we have so many. So I'm sorry. I'm I, I'm listening to you and I'm looking for the next questions that we have in the chat. But OK, so let's see. Um, OK, so let's see. I have a question here. It says, how would you go about? Oh, this is a really interesting, detailed question. So how would you go about explaining some of the I, I'm going to generalize a little bit here, but explaining some of the rules um that letters have so why they sound like another word they sound differently in different words ah okay um over the the past couple of years i've become familiar with a term called heart words and i love it because there are some words out there come and there are excellent excellent examples where mm -hmm. they're not present pronounced the way that we would um, anticipate based on the spelling pattern rules that we know about. C-O-M-E, you would think was comb, like home, right? But we know it's come. Mm -hmm. um, and what I found is really effective is to help kids focus on the sound spelling relationships that actually are pred predictable and doing what we expect in that mm -hmm. word. So if you look at the word, the word come, the C and the M are actually doing what they what we would predict that they would do. And so the part that the child needs to memorize or you know commit to memory is the fact that the O in that in that word, the O and the E operate differently. So mm -hmm. they're going to make that short U sound. Um, and uh, similarly with the word there, the TH is making that TH sound. But mm -hmm. here, instead of fear, which is sort of how we would want to pronounce it if we were using our spelling rules. Mm -hmm. um, the part that's a little irregular is the E-R-E. -E. But mm -hmm. guess what? There are other words that also use that, what we would call maybe quote unquote irregular spelling patterns. So there's mm -hmm. there, but there's also where. So you mm -hmm. can uh, not only have kids focus on the parts of the word that are regular, but you can also link up some of those uh, so-called irregular words with other mm -hmm. words that sort of share the same irregularity. So mm -hmm. where and there, um, and then they can sort of learn those in a group. All right, that's good. I like that grouping the letters that are not very regular and kind of using that to leverage their, their learning. All right, so here's my question. And this came up for me while I was, I was listening to everybody and we were talking about building confidence in readers. Um, as a teacher, a lot of times I experienced, I had a lot of students who would like to read the same book again and again and again and again. And it was right. the same book about rhinos. Like they had it memorized. They knew every single book, word in the rhino book. So when it comes to, as a parent, thinking about when your kid reading a book again and again and again, should you be worried about that? Should you be trying to push them to read other books? What, how, how as a parent would be probably the best way to attack, support, or redirect? Well, first of all, um not to worry that is so common little kids mm -hmm. love to read the same book over and over again and you use the word memorize that's why they've memorized the story they feel confident mm -hmm. it's like they're they're sort of um rehearsing that idea of reading independently mm -hmm. and it makes them feel good and they probably really enjoy the story too um mm -hmm. so celebrate that 
um, and celebrate it as an occasion for kids. Um, they're, they're learning about story structure and how books work. And they're also associating reading a book with having fun, which is what we really want when we want to uh, raise lifelong learners. Mm -hmm. You can also try and introduce um, books that are by the same author. So mm -hmm. books that have a certain illustration style or, mm -hmm. or com uh, com comical element or something that appeals to them to, mm -hmm. to get them to branch out eventually, but not to worry if they're reading the same book over and over again. You're not alone. <laughs> so it's okay, we can get on board with that. All right, so I did just type in the chat. I just wanted to shout out if anybody had any last minute um, questions. I know I probably have one more question about math before we go, but um, I wanted to just throw that out there. If you had any more math questions, I wanted to highlight a couple of those. I feel like we've been a little reading heavy tonight. Um, but I did have a math question. So a lot of the homework that kids get that they're taking home looks really different than the math education that maybe a lot of the parents who are helping the kiddos um, have received. So how do they navigate, how are they able to help them? Yeah, so math is maybe a little different than how it was, you know, when I was a kid myself. So, mm -hmm. you know, when I was a child, it was a matter of just following the rules and memorizing things. Mm -hmm. And it was very little of, well, why are we doing this and how does this work? You know, so today teachers really want to help students understand the why behind the rules and kids are learning things in multiple ways and learning multiple ways to solve the same problems. And this gives them different strategies and tools uh, that they can use, you know, not only a math class, but different, you know, ways of thinking to be better problem solvers in general. So, you know, the math that kids are learning now, it's more than just memorizing specific rules, but it's more making good problem solvers that are more equipped to solve problems throughout their lives. I love that. Problem solving. It, so they could take that and learning it in a different way and apply it to um, other things. It's great. Yes, absolutely. Um, great. So, uh, oh, here I have an interesting question that came up here. How would you practice numbers with kindergartners in a fun way, specifically numbers 0 to 20? So we know that kindergartners are working on mastering 0 to 20 um, in that academic year. So do you have any recommendations? Let's see. For, yeah, I mean, you know, it depends, you know, you, they love applying things to their own lives, you know, mm -hmm. so whether it's, you know, you know, one fun way to incorporate, you know, data uh, or numbers and also while doing data and probability or at the same time, you know, mm -hmm. you can say, you know, well, how many people have a cat and, you know, you know, tallying, you know, counting those people, you know, you know, we have mm -hmm. one, two, three, you know, maybe 10 students with a cat and how many have a dog at home? And so not only, you know, are we making it real life and applicable to things that are in their own worlds, but also you can then take it to the next step and you can put the data, you know, on the board and you can even create a, you know, a little pictograph or a bar mm -hmm. chart too. But, you know, by making it something that gives them purpose and understanding the why and, you know, and making it meaningful to them, that's, you know, you're going to make it more fun. And I can definitely also attest to that because I think the times I made my kindergartners feel the most important in my time in the classroom was when I gave them a clipboard so they could go tally numbers. And, and, and you know, they love, like, you know, when you give them an assignment, you know, go ask your neighbor, go ask your family members, you mm -hmm. know, and they, they love going, you know, or ask, you know, the second grade class down the hall, you know, collecting that data is always just a lot of fun too. Mm -hmm. It's so important to make it real and make it matter so it's useful and they can see how math is important in everyday life. All right, well, I think that we've gotten to just about all of our questions and answers that we had. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you so much to Carolyn and Tiffany for joining us tonight. It was such a wonderful, wonderful experience, wonderful conversation. Um, and I just wanted to let everybody know before we hopped off that um, LeapFrog Academy is holding a sweepstakes. So if with class tag, so from now until the end of the month for 10 people, uh, 10, 10 different classrooms or 10 teachers, we are going to give them a chance to win a subscription to LeapFrog Academy for one whole year. So if you go to the class tag Facebook page, you will be able to click the link that we have posted over there and be able to enter the sweepstakes. 
So um, Leapfrog Academy is really excellent, excellent as a resource for your kids. And I really highly encourage everybody to check it out. Um, and with that, I want to say thank you so much to everybody for your wonderful questions. Thank you so much to uh, my co-hosts here for the great answers uh, that they were able to share with everybody. And uh, it, this was just such a wonderful conversation. I'm really grateful that we had it. Thanks, Brittany. Thank you for having us. Yes, All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I hope everybody has a great evening. Take, uh, take it easy and take care. Thanks, Bye. you too. <laughs> Bye. Bye.